Ladies and gentlemen, it's Easter Sunday, the year's 2011. This is a continuation of my two previous tutorials uh, demonstrating the uh, versatility and capabilities of the musical instrument digital interface. MIDI, we don't see too much of this today in the music of 2011, uh, but back in the 1980s, uh, MIDI was in its heyday. The Yamaha Corporation, the Roland Corporation, the Korg Corporation, we're producing keyboard technology with this musical instrument digital interface that allowed you to seamlessly integrate different kinds of synthesis engines together, namely by basically daisy chaining keyboards together uh, and being able to trigger all of those sounds at the same time. It's a very amazing um, thing to be able to do that. The key with it is, is like classical orchestration. You can't just plug some keyboards together and turn them on and expect them to sound good. You have to find different, different, differing uh, synth architectures, basically which is different synthesis engines, different means of producing electronic sound that are slightly different that act as your colors of the orchestra. Your brass section, your woodwind section, your string section, obviously uh, different waveforms, different formats within those instruments. So as you mix those in an orchestra, you try to do the same thing with your MIDI keyboard. So the key to it basically is, rather than say having five DX7s, which is one of the ways that MIDI started, if you remember the DX7 came out in a single keyboard and then the most amazing thing at that time was you could, I can't get, remember the name of the unit, you could get eight DX7s in a rack and each one of those modules was in a rack, uh, a box basically, but there were eight tone modules of the DX7 all in one rack that were daisy chained together via MIDI. You could put each one to respond on a different MIDI channel and hence here was your little keyboard orchestra. Uh, quite a few people use that. Uh, I never bought that unit because I don't like the, the original DX7 uh, synthesis engine nearly as much as I like the DX7 II, which is, uh, greatly expands those capabilities of uh, FM synthesis, frequency modulation synthesis. Um, to make a long story short, when you string your instruments together to have them trigger from one source, you try to find synthesizers with differing uh, architecture, meaning simply whatever produces the sound in the instrument is different than whatever the other instrument is. Uh, I don't have my, my large 22 space rack with my modular MIDI modules in it, which is a better example, so I'm going to do this on a smaller scale. Basically, the DX7 is FM synthesis, frequency modulation synthesis, that's its own thing, where you have uh, operators that produce sine waves that are modulated with one another to produce sounds. That's uh, the, the architecture of the DX7. It's very pleasing. It has a, a um, wide EQ range with a very big warm low end, a clean top end. Just very pleasing over all the, the frequencies. I'd like to correct myself for one of the, the my previous tutorial where I said in balancing the keyboard you want to balance the formats. The formats was not what I meant. I meant scaling the keyboard, which basically is you want the volume to be even from the bottom to the top. It's very simple. This is what, what they do that on acoustic piano is they take a little uh, pick that has three needles in it and they actually pick the head of the felt tip of the hammer and that softens or, or hardens the, the, the sound of the hammer striking the, the, the string and also affects the volume. So what you're trying to achieve and all of your keyboard sounds is a consistent even volume from the bottom to the top. Basically the same volume for this C, 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 for this C. As you play all the way down and all the way up, the volume remains consistent so that nothing jumps out at you whenever you change registers. This is what I try to do. Anytime I try to scale uh, a sample piano sound on say the RD700, you have to use the EQ to do that and you just put basically I put on noise reduction headphones so that you're not influenced by the myriad of infrasound that's in the air, low frequency sound waves that modulate the sound. You need to hear purely what's coming out of the instrument 
and, and balance those volumes. This C is the same as this C is the same as this, no matter that they're in different registers and firing at a much lower frequency, the volume should be the same, so that it's even from the bottom to the, to the top. That gives you a musical sound upon which to play. Um, people will dispute that, but that you can never go wrong with a, with a synth sound that's scaled. Um, and there's a way that you can do it on the DX7. I don't know exactly how to do that. But uh, FM, frequency modulation synthesis in the DX7 II, as opposed to structured adaptive synthesis, which is in the Roland P330 or the MKS20 piano module. I don't know exactly how that works, structured adaptive synthesis. It's not sampling, but it's a different synthesis architecture and therefore complements the DX7 FM synthesis. So two different things with slightly different means of producing sound give you timbral variation, which is pleasing not the same thing layered on top of one another and the SG rack basically is just a um, straightforward sampled uh, keyboard module with a very good sample grand piano and the rest of the sounds in there are, are also digital samples of real instruments so even with just these three modules a sampled module structured adaptive synthesis and FM frequency modulation already I'm getting a nice uh, blend of those three different types of means of production of sound that makes your final keyboard sound richer than Joe Blow over here on the side. So this is a little trick. Uh, in my 22 space rack I have an Oberheim Matrix 6 which is also a it's an analog synthesizer but it actually uses digitally controlled oscillators rather than VCOs voltage controlled oscillators. So the Oberheim Matrix 6 DCOs but analog filters which are unique to the Oberheim brand. They call them CEM chips, integrated circuits, and the filter is what you're striving uh, to, to get. It's the quality of the filter in an analog synth that gives you the sound. The, the filters on the Prophet 5 made by sequential circuits and the filters on the uh, MKS-80 Super Jupiter made by Roland and the, the filters on the Oberheim OBXA or OB8, uh, especially if you have voltage controlled oscillators, give you this amazing analog sound that you don't hear too often today. They've been fairly successful in the past, past decade of uh, producing uh, virtual plugins for your Macintosh computer, which is uh, computer modeling. I didn't step into that uh, region yet because you have to own a very powerful Mac and I didn't want to invest in a, in a computer-based system, so I, I think that the, there are things that you can buy there, um, synth sample cell that offer you, uh, that's basically where the, the wave of the, the current stream of synthesis is, is VST plugins for your Mac. Uh, you got to have a heavy Macintosh to be able to run that, and I grew up in the, in the old school where your sounds come from your keyboards, not from your computer, and I still prefer, prefer it that way. I'm an avid uh, Mac user. Uh, but in terms of playing keyboards, a module that you can plug in is always going to be indispensable. I have an SC55 Roland Sound Canvas Half Space Module, which is a general MIDI set uh, of sampled sounds. I have the Yamaha TX802, which basically is the, the same as the, the DX72, slightly different architecture in that it has you can also separate that into eight separate tone generators on the front panel. And, and trigger a different sound via a different MIDI channel. I don't use it that way. It's the rack space module of the DX7 II with a slight variation there. Uh, it's a nice module. I have a Korg M3R, which is the rack mounted version of the one of the best selling keyboards of all time. The Korg M1 and the DX7 II by Yamaha, the two highest selling keyboards. The M3R is a single rack space. It's a little persnickety with controlling MIDI volume of the patches. But here again, that architecture is, is it takes sampled transients. So you would sample not the whole sound, but the attack transient, the snap of the string, and add that to a, 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 an analog oscillator produced sound. That architecture was a beautiful, beautiful and uh, made the M1 one of the top selling keyboards. Uh, still very, very good factory sounds as it came programmed from the factory. 
Um, the M3R, the rack space mount of that one rack space, has probably the best sampled Fender Road sound that I can think of. It's in the Korg M3R. It's difficult to control the MIDI volume of it, but in terms of the, the purity of a, the, the best kind of standard suitcase Fender Rhodes with a, maybe a little of tremolo on there, I remember is on the M3R. Uh, I have an MKS-80 Roland Super Jupiter, which is a VCO analog synthesizer that Dave Foster used to, to play bass lines for many of his hit songs for Celine Dion um, and Whitney Houston. This huge, low, droning uh, analog bass sound that Hans Zimmer also uses the MKS-80 uh, as the, the, the major module in his entire studio. Uh, I don't have that many sounds in that instrument, but it's nice because like a mini Moog, has a very low end and, and a very warm, big sound, um, which is, proponents would say analog is more likely to give you that than say digital. Uh, to wrap all of that up, all that technology was going to give you, I had to stop in the middle of my other presentation, I want to show you some more of my layered sounds that I have here, that, which to me, I, I couldn't remember, I haven't played this setup in about 10 years, it's been in storage. So one reason why I'm doing this video is to remind myself what I've invested in this particular system to remember how it works so that I won't let that go. I want to preserve that. I have all of my synth sounds saved in an editor librarian program for the Macintosh. Some of them are in Opcodes Galaxy. Some of them are in Mark of the Unicorns Unison, although the new Unison program for Mac OS X doesn't want to seem to read my programs from Unison running on Mac 8.5 on a Power Mac. So I'm trying to navigate that uh, glitch that I've got right now so that I can have all my old synth patches updated on my new laptop computer and I could use those to load them in. Haven't solved that problem yet. With the, the MIDI control patch bay, you can be very creative. You, you can use these tools for your own creativity to design sound uh, with almost a limitless boundary of of producing sound other than just you know sitting at the piano. New music, uh, the Harry Parch Ensemble, stretches the boundaries of traditional tonality. Harry Parch used microtuning and built his own original instruments that were, instead of using equal temperament and using the, the, the semitone or the tone, used quarter tones and eighth tones and fifth tones, uh, which you can tune any traditional instrument that way, adds a new sonic capability more akin to the avant-garde period in jazz where or the abstract expressionist movement in painting where you're trying to elicit a pure emotional response from the listener with your sound which is something that I'm trying to achieve here. Uh, it makes your music making process very personal and so also volatile and vulnerable at the same time when you're providing a direct liaison between your human feeling and the sound that you're producing. You have to be accountable for what it is that you're feeling and the effect that you're going to have on other people, but that seamless integration is really what you're trying to do. Kurzweil used it in their logo back in the 1980s. Sounds to move the soul, soul music. Uh, that's once you play soul music. I've played uh, hip-hop and old-school R&B for two years in a band that was all African Americans. One of the most uh, enjoyable periods of my life, two years playing in all black clubs. This is the rig that I had to come up with. It's soul music. Everything that you play, you feel. There is no listening. Everything that you play has feeling, and you can move people with just one note, depending on how it is that you um, accentuate that. I'm going to have to get on and demonstrate. Uh, my parents will be coming home from church, and I don't like to upset them with doing things out here in the garage. Um, to start, uh, here's one patch that I that I did that has SG rack strings on the bottom, Korg strings. The Korg and the Roland strings both are very good. Uh, I'll take my glasses off. <laughs> Q 
excuse me, I don't hear any sound coming out of my stereo amp here, so I'm going to have to tweak a little bit. It is, it doesn't seem very loud for some reason, so I'm going to turn this up. To balance your stereo sound, I, I want to hear equal sounds between the left amp and the right amp. That's better. Sunday I'm not doing a very good job of, of playing because I'm not I'm not feeling it in my fingers but your tinkle piano basically was uh, a good figure that created that particular sound was Claude Thornhill uh, who Gil Evans arranged for before he met up with Miles Davis and produced Porgy and Bess sketches of Spain or Miles Ahead Claude Thornhill uh, his particular group had French horns flutes in it so it bridged the gap between classical European music and jazz um, but he was a piano player but if you listen to Claude Thornhill Snowfall was uh, one of his best sides well track cut uh, the tinkle piano right you have this lush uh, kind of romantic underpinning but then your piano the whole function of that is to be the, the tinkler it's a very move, moving thing it's just one aspect of the piano but as you notice, that, that's transposed, so I'm playing all of that piano stuff in the upper register, and you want to play that quietly. Normally, you know, your octave would be, that's still up an octave too high, so I'm playing in the extreme range of the acoustic piano. stress very different from the pop school of piano playing which I do not like very much and I'm forced again and again to do this when I go to ship contracts for Royal Caribbean International the pop concept is a completely different thing based upon guitar oriented music and the strumming of the guitar if you watch Ray Manzarek from The Doors play the piano and the majority of other piano players there, including Elton John and Leon Russell who was on Saturday Night Live not too long ago, when you watch these guys play, their wrists are very limp, their body is limp, and what they're doing is emulating the strumming of the guitar on the piano. This is the way that you play pop feel, something that, that I am very unwilling to do after spending years of classical training developing strength in your fingers to be able to control each digit in a line with phraseology changing the volume of each note so that you have a phrase that has dynamic nuance within a phrase of notes rather than the pop concept which is basically you just bounce back and forth between your two hands this is what the way Elton John plays I respect him uh, and that's a that's a, a a notable groove and you watch how they play your whole body has to be loose and you play extremely ahead of the beat this is different 
when you want sound with substance that comes from the classical tradition, Western Europe, European music and jazz, this is what I strive for every time I sit down to play the piano, is that I have substance and sustain uh, in each one of my piano notes, which means that you have to push on the key and play down to the key bed and hold that key down to make that note sing like the human voice would sing a song, rather than pecking at the notes. As I play those, those figures, you see me pushing the note and holding my finger down. And how long that note will sing, even though it plucks and there's nothing there to keep the sound going. That's the key, a sostenuto piano sound that will sing, be lyrical, and let the melody speak above your other chords. Both have merit, but if you want to connect and move a listener, the more power that you have in your fingers, the better. This is what we strive. I ride 16 miles on my bike to strengthen my legs, uh, and I try to keep my, my, my bike is good. It gives you the proper posture. If you ride like this, you build up strength here. You have a stance for playing keyboards like you do for any other sport, and bicycle riding is the perfect uh, choice because you ride like this, you build strength in your arms, and your stance, hence, is the way that you're going to play the piano. When I play on the ships to, to, to navigate the stormy waters of the pop rhythmic concept, I often have to change to what I call my classical uh, technique. Normally, if I'm playing jazz, uh, or the way that I did the original part of my life, is I tend to lean and pull back on the keys to give me the sostenuto that I'm looking for. It makes it very easy to connect with a poor instrument. I'm actually pulling and leaning back to give me that substance. joy about the Hammond organ and why I did that instructional video. It's also why um, I like to ride motocross on my, I have my motorcycle here and I like to skate. I'm a skateboarder. You makes you use your extremities more than you would if you just play acoustic piano and you sit, you're using one foot on the pedal, which is nice in a lot of these kind of movements, the classical pianos. I don't necessarily think that any of that is that important. I think what is important is that you have uh, dexterity and you have independence and are used to using all four of your limbs at the same time. When you play the Hammond organ, that's what you do. That's what I like. I get a more full release uh, of a musical experience because I'm using all four of my limbs very much like a set drummer uses all four of his limbs. Play the ride cymbal, to play the snare drum, to play the hi-hat with your left foot and to play the kick drum with your right foot. When you play the organ, I'm playing the volume pedal here. I would be playing bass pedals toe to heel here with my left hand. I'd be playing things here, left hand bass, I'd be playing here. All of your limbs are moving at the same time, doing different things, all while you're balanced, sitting on your bone. So you have to be an athlete. That said, speaking of touch, uh, I want to give you a few more here uh, examples of creative things that you can do on the piano. I think this is an interesting one. I took the same piano patch and split it over two different keyboards and changed the register so that within this framework, if you're sitting at the 88, the, playing the 88 note piano is, is different than this. So I'm, I'm giving you information for my own setup that I've created within my own little bubble of musical creativity that, that you can gig with. This is small. 
I can pack this up in 10 minutes and I can, when I set up to play a gig, I have a lot of expressive capabilities here that you can't get in a small package with a, a Bosendorfer 88 note huge 10 foot grand piano or a Yamaha C7 that costs $50,000. I'm trying to get many of the same bells and whistles in this little electronic rig, uh, which is great. You know, I don't want to play a badly tuned acoustic piano. I would rather play my rig because I know it's going to sound good. Here. top of the piano I have starting here. So basically my, my last two octaves that you can't get on a five octave keyboard, here's the, like if you do want to play the extreme high notes of the 88 notes or the extreme low notes, you can't do that on a five octave keyboard as I showed. So as I played my tinkle piano, I used that patch and I transposed that so that I could use that upper register. Here is my split piano patch. So I have my lower register of the piano here, this octave. <laughs> Is actually lower than a normal acoustic piano would go. It has the low notes that the Bussendorfer would play, which are just amazing. Uh, and also all your, your, that would be your highest note here. Both of these sounds, it's the same sound, are controlled by the volume pedal because it's uh, the controller comes out of the top keyboard. The low register of the piano used oftentimes in film and TV music as I play. should have this one transposed up one more octave. I'm not sure that's the highest note of the piano. Isn't there another octave? Yeah, that I need here, so I need to go one more octave up here. This low uh, register of the piano is what I think is so interesting. The sonic capabilities of those frequencies communicate, move air directly, rather than trying to find a sonority. There's enough sonic information there that, like the bass, is the, the major instrument that you feel when you go to a band concert. Uh, the bass frequencies are what we feel uh, in our body. We don't feel upper frequency sounds, so the, the bass is very important uh, to providing feel of music. Not all the time, but uh, is indispensable because if you turn it up loud enough, you can actually feel the vibrations on your body. I play electric bass too, and when I play bass, this is the number one thing that I do is I turn my bass setting all the way up and I stand in front of my amp so I can feel those bass frequencies on my rear end and that's the way I play. As Tony Williams did, Wayne Shorter did in Miles Davis's band, you play to the sound. You actually play to the sound that you're hearing. As you hear, you're using your mind actively to shape what it is that you're hearing with your ears. That's the highest level that you'll ever achieve, and if you if you if you strive for that, to play to the sound, to get your sound to the highest level of, of pleasingness to your ear, 